your husband got my wife pregnant. Pay $100,000 in damages, you scum. On the day of my wedding. Suddenly, Victor entered the waiting room, making an unbelievable demand. His expression was one of pride. However, Victor Brown himself was unaware of the contradiction in his demand. It seemed that Nathan, who was next to him, had also noticed this. Is that really true? Yes. Why would I lie? Understand? Now pay the damages. However, we did not agree. Because we knew that that story was definitely a lie. Nathan and I couldn't help but laugh at Victor Brown's anger. My name is Judy Hill. 34 years old. Living a boring life while working as an ordinary office worker. Raised by ordinary parents, I lived as an ordinary person. I never ventured into tricky things and was carried along by those around me. Well, I can't really answer what is considered ordinary. Yet, I had a particular concern in life. That was my inability to get married. Most of my close friends, colleagues, and juniors at work were married and had families. But I missed the chance and was left behind. It was hard to invite friends to hang out on weekends because they all had families. So, on weekends, I would stay inside and just kill time watching recorded dramas and variety shows. When I saw piles of juice bottles and cans of alcohol, I felt an overwhelming sense of emptiness. Will I be alone forever? The thought of the future filled me with indescribable fear. But it seemed pointless to take action now. After all, no man would probably ever fall in love with me. I was almost giving up on marriage, living day by day. However, a turning point came for me. I found a boyfriend. He wasn't strange or violent. Just an ordinary, kind man. His name was Nathan. I met him through work. A new client came to the company where I work, and Nathan was the representative. Initially, our conversations were casual, but gradually we grew closer and started dating. Later, Nathan proposed to me. Hey. Should we get married? What? His straightforward proposal left me uttering a bewildered response. Looking at Nathan, he slowly met my eyes and smiled gently. I accepted his proposal. I was truly happy. I had almost given up, but to think I'd meet and marry such a wonderful man. A new life was starting. A new, happy life. As I reveled in these fluffy feelings, I imagined the days I would spend with Nathan. But, I had forgotten. About the only person in my life who wasn't ordinary. I have a sister close to my age. Her name is Sherry. Sherry has always been mean to me. As a child, she would take my toys or hide my things. She even broke my toys out of spite, even though it was my birthday. In elementary school, she intentionally ruined my homework by spilling juice. She also hid my pencil case and things borrowed from friends. Sis. Where did you put the book I borrowed from my friend? A book? I don't know what you're talking about. I always kept it on my desk. I haven't moved it. I told you, I don't know. It's sad that your friends lend you things only for you to lose. I never mishandled anything I borrowed. It was only natural, considering I was borrowing them. And, our parents wouldn't touch my things without permission. So, it was obvious to think that Sherry had done something. Please, stop it. Give it back now. Ugh. So annoying. When I insisted strongly, Sherry reluctantly took out the item I was looking for from her desk. Here, isn't this what you want? You're so noisy. It's just one thing missing, don't make such a fuss. She threw the item at me. Even though I said it was borrowed, her carelessness made me anxious. Indeed, due to Sherry's actions, some items were broken or stained. And I had to buy replacements with my allowance. After Sherry's behavior worsened, I stopped borrowing things from others. 
but it seemed irrelevant to Sherry. She would use my manga and stationery without permission, returning them dirty. Consequently, many of my belongings had stains and dirt. We grew into middle and high school students. Sherry continued her harassment unabated. She should have found something else to enjoy. I pitied Sherry. However, one day in my second year of high school, an incident occurred. Shockingly, Sherry stole my boyfriend. A few days before I discovered it, I had lost contact with my boyfriend and was worried. Then, Sherry started fiddling with her smartphone in front of me with a smug look. I spoke to her without thinking much, as she seemed to want me to talk to her. What are you doing? Sherry looked at me as if she had been waiting for this moment. Guess what I'm doing? I don't know. Your boyfriend. He's really cute, isn't he? What? I didn't understand what she was saying. I had shown her a photo of my boyfriend when we first started dating. But there was no way she had any connection with him. Wondering if she didn't understand his character, I was speechless. Then, Sherry showed me her smartphone screen. To my surprise, there was a photo of Sherry and my boyfriend, looking like a couple. What? Why? Sherry replied with a smug smile to my unexpected words. I stole your boyfriend. What? I found him on social media and he was so easy. Your boyfriend, I've liked him since I saw his photo. It turned out that he hadn't been contacting me because he had moved on to my sister. He's not the kind of person to just move on. Then, what's this? Sherry proudly showed me their interaction on social media. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to see it anymore. I scrolled through Sherry's phone to check if her story was true. There were messages from my boyfriend about liking Sherry and moving on from me. No way. See? He likes me, not you. So, don't talk about my boyfriend anymore. Sherry said this with a triumphant look. I was just speechless. Then, I immediately called my boyfriend. What's going on? You started dating my sister. However, my boyfriend, seemingly indifferent to my confusion, said, well, yeah. Why? Because Sherry is cuter and kinder than you. No way. I couldn't believe my ears. Sherry, kind. That can't be true. I wanted to deny it. But I was more shocked that my boyfriend had chosen Sherry. And thought she was kinder than me. I couldn't say anything. What, is that it? Okay, then, I'm hanging up. Wait, just a... Bye. And just like that, our relationship ended. I had finally gotten a boyfriend. But because of Sherry, this happened. I never thought Sherry, who had always been nasty to me, would steal my boyfriend. She must really hate me. But why? I couldn't figure out the reason, no matter how much I thought about it. I had consulted my parents about Sherry several times. They had scolded her every time. But I couldn't bring myself to tell them that she had stolen my boyfriend. She must know I can't talk to anyone about this. Sherry proudly introduced my ex-boyfriend to our parents as her new boyfriend. She talked about their dates and plans to stay over. And always in front of me. My parents, of course, didn't realize he was my ex-boyfriend and listened happily. Judy, don't you want a boyfriend too? Yes. Knowing my mother meant no harm, I couldn't say anything. I just quietly responded to her words. Sherry, who had been showing off her good relationship with her boyfriend, ended up breaking up with him in less than two months. The reason wasn't clear, but I saw her getting angry in her room, so they must have fought. The boyfriend who easily switches girlfriends. Perhaps Sherry was also cheated on. Ever since breaking up with him, Sherry's temper only got worse. And, of course, she took it out on me. Why were you dating such a guy? He's the worst. You stole my boyfriend and now you're saying this. You're the worst. 
if you hadn't dated him, I wouldn't even think of dating him. It's all your fault. Sherry wouldn't listen. In the end, she was a hopeless person. Who couldn't be satisfied unless things went her way and lashed out at others. I knew this, so I should have just let it go, but for some reason. I talked back regarding the boyfriend issue. In hindsight, I realized he was the worst boyfriend. But at that time, I really loved my boyfriend. So I guess I kept talking back because I still had feelings for him. Because I talked back, Sherry got angry and retorted as well. After the incident with my boyfriend, Sherry and I barely spoke, and our relationship deteriorated. Later, when Sherry started living alone as a university student, we became just like any other siblings, not particularly close. But not in a bad relationship either. However, due to a certain event, Sherry started harassing me again. The trigger was her marriage. The man she married was Victor Brown. They met at a mixer and got married. Congratulations, sis. I was invited to the wedding and offered my congratulations. I thought she would be pleased, but... Ah, uh, Judy. Sorry, I got married before you. You should find a good man and get married soon, too. Well, it's probably impossible though. Sherry made such demeaning remarks at the wedding, a special occasion. Wow, I really found a great guy. You should be thankful, you know? I didn't even want to invite you to my wedding. But I thought mom and dad might say something, so that's why you're here. Oh, I see. What, I said I invited you when I didn't want to. And you can't even say thank you? That's unbelievable. Sherry laughed out loud with her mouth wide open. Sorry. Because of this, I couldn't focus at the wedding. I couldn't even feel like celebrating. I ate while being swayed by the surroundings. And watched a video of memories made by Sherry and Victor's friends. Everyone was moved. But I couldn't remember what was shown in the video. Because Sherry's earlier words were stuck in my head. After that wedding, Sherry and I hardly talked anymore. I heard from mother that Victor and Sherry are now living with them. Apparently, Sherry begged to live with them because their incomes were low. Five years have passed since Sherry got married. Not wanting to meet Sherry and them, I only went back home for Christmas. Now, feeling depressed, I had to go back home to announce my marriage. Before going home, I talked to Nathan about Sherry several times. I don't think she'll be rude to someone she's meeting for the first time. But if you feel uncomfortable, please let me know, okay? It's okay. I'll accept anyone. But, Judy, you seem so worried. I'm a bit scared. Nathan always had a kind smile. I tried to choose a time when Sherry wouldn't be there for our visit but she insisted on seeing the man I was marrying. I didn't want to show him, but we'd have to meet eventually. Especially at the wedding, it would be awful to have her interfere. I calmed myself down and pressed the doorbell of my parents' house. Welcome. The front door opened, and my smiling mother came out. Come in, come in. Following my mother's words, we sat down on the living room sofa. I gently rubbed Nathan's back, who was tense. I had never seen him this nervous before. Will it be okay? Is he scared of Sherry? Or is he just nervous about talking to my parents? There were many possibilities, but I didn't know the answer. Good to see you. We've been waiting. Finally, Judy is getting married. I'm glad you found a wonderful person. Judy. My parents congratulated us on our marriage. Nathan's expression softened, and he returned to his usual self. I hoped everything would end without any issues. Just then, the living room door opened. So, they didn't let us off. I glanced towards the door, and there stood Sherry and Victor, smirking. Sis. Wow. He's actually a good-looking guy. 
Without greeting, Sherry sat next to Nathan and wrapped her arm around his. Hey. Sherry. Father tried to stop her, but Sherry didn't listen. There should be limits to what you can do, even with a sister's husband. I also tried to stop her, but Sherry tightened her grip even more. Nathan, looking troubled, started introducing himself in a gentle voice. I'm Nathan Hill. Nice to meet you. Your name is Nathan. Her familiarity was off-putting for a first meeting. I couldn't help feeling disgusted and frowned. Judy. Don't make such a disgusted face. That's rude. What? Judy, you got something to say? Sherry looked at me with a different, scary expression than the one she had for Nathan. Sorry. It's nothing. I thought it would be bad to escalate the situation, so I reluctantly apologized. My apology seemed to please Sherry and Victor. They surrounded Nathan, asking about how we met, who proposed, and why we decided to get married. That would have been fine, but their choice of words were too crude. I frowned again in discomfort, and Victor noticed. What's with that face? <laughs> You're already unattractive, so stop it. I wondered why Victor was so harsh towards me. It was because Sherry was harsh towards me. He must think he can say anything to me. Indeed, I've come to think it's futile to talk back, so I don't. That probably makes him believe even more that he can say whatever he wants. In the end, my parents intervened, and our marriage introduction was over. Nathan and I headed home. Sorry, for everything. It's okay. Are you alright? Even after such a terrible experience, Nathan was still smiling and concerned about me. I was genuinely happy, but at the same time. I felt unsure if it was okay for me to marry such a wonderful person. He's such a great guy. Maybe there's someone more suitable for him than me. But I can't bring myself to ask him directly. What should I do? With no one to consult, the preparations for our marriage went on. Half a year later, Nathan and I, having registered our marriage, were about to have our wedding ceremony. The solemn atmosphere of the venue, the beautiful dress, and the hair and makeup felt like a surreal experience. My heart was racing at the thought of this moment. Looking back at the past six months, my life had been miserable. Sherry, having eavesdropped on conversations between my parents and me, located the house where Nathan and I lived. Since then, she'd been making excuses to barge into our house. And it wasn't just Sherry. Victor would come into our house without any bad intentions, drinking and causing a commotion. Despite repeatedly telling them not to come to our house, they wouldn't listen. He would drink incessantly and make demeaning remarks at me. I can't believe someone like you got married. It's unbelievable you're Sherry's sister. Why are you so ugly? It's embarrassing to have a relative like you. I couldn't say anything back to Victor Brown's words. Say something. His sudden angry shout made me tremble, and he continued his verbal abuse. Ugh. Gross. I feel sick. I'm going home. He'd come, get angry on his own, and leave. Victor was probably just using me as an outlet for his stress. If I just endure it, it will eventually end. That thought had somehow become ingrained in my mind. Even if we have the wedding ceremony, those two's behavior won't change. Should we move? As I was lost in thought, the door to the dressing room opened. Judy, are you okay? When I turned around, Nathan was there, smiling kindly and checking up on me. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. During that brief moment, Nathan and I had a light-hearted conversation to ease each other's nerves. By the way. But as I was about to bring up a new topic, the dressing room door opened again. Startled, I looked over and saw a furious Victor and a Criangle Sherry. What could have happened? As I was stunned by their odd appearance, Victor shouted. 
your husband got my wife pregnant. Pay us $100,000 in damages, you scumbags. The moment I heard Victor's words, Nathan and I burst into uncontrollable laughter. Naturally, Sherry and Victor Brown were dumbfounded. Hey. What are you laughing at? This is serious. Do you have any proof? Proof? Sherry told me. If Sherry says it's true, it must be true. Yes. Nathan got me pregnant. How? How? Well. Sherry was perplexed by my question. Victor might call me vulgar, but what I wanted to know wasn't about that. Sis, you can't get pregnant, right? What? Sherry awkwardly averted her gaze at my words. You drunkenly blurted it out when you barged into our house. Nathan heard it too, so it's not a mistake. Oh, and you said you told mom too, right? Let's check with her. Wait. Judy. There's no way I'm going to let them make me the bad guy. I pushed past Sherry's attempts to stop me and called for my mother. My parents, Nathan's parents. And even relatives who heard the commotion crowded into the dressing room. In front of all these people, I boldly asked about Sherry's condition. Initially hesitant, my mother's attitude changed after I explained the situation. Yes. Sherry can't get pregnant. She told me herself, and I even accompanied her to the doctor because she was worried. Mom. It seemed that even my mother couldn't forgive Sherry for trying to extort money from us with a lie. She looked at Sherry and Victor with fierce anger. In the stunned dressing room, Sherry and Victor were clearly panicking. Um, well. Hey, Sherry. You can't get pregnant? Why didn't you tell me? I thought you'd leave me if I told you. You love kids. But you didn't have to lie. What are you going to do now? Without apologizing to us, the two started arguing. The scene was pitiful. It seemed that Sherry had lied to Victor Brown. If Sherry claimed that Nathan had gotten her pregnant, it would overwhelmingly weaken the man's position. Even if Nathan isn't at fault and has no obligation to pay compensation, his social reputation might still suffer. Not being pregnant doesn't prove the absence of such a relationship. However, that's only true for someone who can normally get pregnant. Sherry, having drunkenly disclosed her condition before, seemed to have forgotten and was confidently claiming to be a victim. It was clear that Sherry was at fault. Why did you tell such a lie, Sherry? That's because. Answer me. Trembling at my father's words, Sherry began to speak. It's because we're out of money. I talked with Victor about pretending I was pregnant by Nathan to get some money. Then, Victor agreed to it. And what if you were asked for proof? Even if you want to claim compensation, you need proper evidence, right? After a brief silence, Sherry muttered, I hadn't thought of that. It was a mess. Thinking only of the short term. She hasn't changed, not then and not now. That's the thought that crossed my mind. At that moment, one of the relatives in the room, my mother-in-law, suddenly spoke up. Victor? Aren't you cheating? The dressing room erupted into noise again. What? Me, cheating? Why would you think that? I saw you at the supermarket where I work with a woman who wasn't Sherry. And with a child, too. I thought her face looked familiar. What? Is that true? One shocking revelation after another was coming to light. I was speechless hearing all this. Hey, what does this mean? Uh, well, no. This is unbelievable. You're the worst. Sherry, driven by anger, tried to break things in the dressing room. My father quickly intervened, and ultimately Sherry and Victor were escorted outside. After that, the wedding proceeded as normal, but of course, those two were not present. Thankfully, the ceremony and reception went smoothly without any issues. 
After the wedding, I asked my parents to keep an eye on those two. But I wonder how long that can last. The first thing we should probably do is move. Or maybe it would be better to consult a lawyer. I don't know where to start. But we need to act quickly. What if they barge into our house again like they usually do? They seem to bear a grudge against us, and it might not end well. Why are we being targeted when we've done nothing wrong? No matter how much I think about it, I can't find an answer. There was no contact from Sherry or Victor. I wondered if they had somehow resolved everything without my knowledge. But could it be that convenient? One day, while pondering this, our doorbell rang. Hesitantly, I peeked at the monitor and saw an agitated Victor. Nathan, Victor is here. Victor? Nathan stood beside me and looked at the monitor. He seems pretty angry. What's bothering him this time? Even Nathan seemed quite wary of Sherry and Victor. He frowned deeply as he watched the monitor. Then, he said, I'll go and listen to what he has to say. Are you sure? Is it safe? We can't make any progress without taking action, right? Just in case, hide and be ready to call the police at any time. Nathan handed me his phone and walked towards the front door. Yes. What do you want? Contrasting Nathan's calm demeanor, Victor began shouting in a highly agitated state. I felt genuinely scared. What do I want? Let me in. That's not possible. We can talk here, can't we? Shut up. Whoa. At Victor's shout, I heard Nathan's surprised voice. Then, with heavy footsteps, Victor forced his way inside. Victor. What are you doing? Shut up. Because of your wedding, I'm in a huge mess. If it weren't for the wedding, my affair wouldn't have been exposed. It's all your fault. Presumably, Victor's affair was revealed by my mother-in-law. Causing trouble between him and Sherry. First of all, it's your fault for cheating, isn't it? Shut up. What's wrong with having a little fun? Acting like such a good guy. With that, Victor began to recklessly knock down furniture and decorations nearby. Hey. What are you doing? Call the police. Call the police. Go ahead, call them if you think you can. Like you could. At this point, Victor was unstoppable. I hurriedly called the police. In just a few minutes, officers arrived at our house. The floor was littered with broken glass, water from vases, and it was a mess. The officers frowned at the dreadful sight. You really called them, huh? Don't mess with me. I won't forgive you for this. Remember. Victor, throwing out a pitiful parting shot, was then taken away by the police. Afterward, the officers asked us what happened and then left. The state of the house was terrible. Nathan and I sighed and began to clean up. It turned out to be the last time we would ever speak with Victor. A few hours later. My phone rang. It was my mother. Wondering if it was about Victor, I quickly answered the call. I'm sorry about Victor causing trouble. Did you hear anything from the police? Apparently, she was asked to pick up Victor from the station. When they arrived, Victor was sulking. My mother said she had listened to his side of the story and then took him home. Sorry for the trouble. It's okay. I'm sorry too. We were supposed to be watching him, but he slipped away. Once you move, I'll tell him to leave our house. If they kicked him out before we moved, he would likely start hanging around our house. Appreciating her concern, I thanked my mother. We discussed each other's situations and the current state of Sherry. And Victor before ending the call. It seems Victor has calmed down. Perhaps the police had a stern talk with him. Sherry, distressed by Victor's actions, was quietly staying in her room. It was the consequence of her selfish behavior. It seemed their relationship as a couple had completely fallen apart. 
what path would they take from here? It seemed unlikely they would reconcile, and divorce seemed the only option. My mother said she would contact me if anything happened, so I decided to wait for her call. A few days later, my mother called. The news was about Sherry and Victor. As I had suspected, they got divorced. Victor left the house quietly, but Sherry, claiming it was her parents' home, refused to leave. However, this behavior angered my father. He was furious about her trying to extort money from us and her continuous lies. Having always been gentle, my father's rage made Sherry crumble, and she decided to leave. By this time, our move was fortunately complete, so I was relieved. I hadn't told anyone our new address, and it was unlikely they would come to our new home. Finally, everything was over. We didn't have to live in fear anymore. That's what I thought, but the day after my mother's call, Sherry called me. Reluctantly, I answered the phone, and Sherry started talking in her usual tone. Hey, Judy. You doing okay? I got kicked out of the house. I have no money. Can I stay at your place? You moved, right? Where are you now? What? Stay over? What are you talking about? What, you're mad at me too? I haven't done anything wrong. Are you still holding a grudge about the past? If so, I'll apologize. Let's live together again. Can you stop making fun of me? I was angry at Sherry's carefree attitude. Holding a grudge? Apologize so she can stay over? It was too much. She hadn't even apologized for the wedding incident. Does she even realize she's done anything wrong? The more I tried to understand Sherry, the more I was filled with aversion. Do you know how much you've hurt me? Holding a grudge? Of course, I am. And about the wedding. You forgot about your condition that you blabbered while you were drunk. And then demanded money from Nathan for getting you pregnant? Stop joking around. You only use us when it's convenient for you. It's embarrassing to even say you're my sister. Before I knew it, I had let out all my thoughts about Sherry. I was truly embarrassed she was my sister. Do you understand how I feel? If you do, then never bother us again. Right after that, I heard a click and the call was disconnected. It was truly over now. Not receiving an apology didn't matter anymore. Just don't bother us again. I was satisfied just having said what I felt. Six months after the incident, Nathan and I were having a normal life. It still makes me mad remembering what happened. But I'm happy we've cut ties with Sherry and Victor. The only regret is not getting compensation for the furniture Victor destroyed. But getting involved with them again isn't worth it. Maybe the decluttering was for the best. Despite the trouble, I'm incredibly happy to be with Nathan. I'm just grateful for our normal life now. Hello, it's me. Have you received the divorce paper yet? This call came 10 days after my husband suddenly disappeared. I won't be coming back anymore. I want you to submit the divorce papers I sent. I'm planning to remarry soon, so please do it quickly. I recently received a sealed envelope containing the completed divorce papers. Where are you now? What are you planning to do about Rachel? Even if we are getting divorced, we need to meet and talk. Dad and Mr. Jackson are worried about you. At that moment, my husband burst into laughter. I'm tired of being considerate towards your father and the boss. If I stay there, I'm going to have to be petty for the rest of my life, right? I'm sick and tired of it. I'm not your slave, you know. I was shocked. I never thought my husband felt that way. I'm not coming back. I'm not afraid even if I lose my job. A business partner has recognized my abilities and offered me a job. 
I can finally live a free life. As I grew increasingly despairing, my husband's voice was incredibly cheerful. Then a woman's voice came on the phone. Madame, please forgive us. Our love is real. Please don't look for us. I'm pregnant. Shocked, I then heard my husband deliver the final blow. That's how it is. So I'm sorry, but I don't need Rachel. Take care. Even after the call ended, I couldn't move for a while. I don't need Rachel. What? My hands were trembling. Even if God forgives my husband, I will never forgive him. I caught my father, gripped the voice recorder tightly, and ran towards Mr. Jackson's company. My name is Emily, thirty-four years old. I work as an architect in my family's construction business. I have a family of three, with my husband Brian, who is a year older than me, and our four-year-old daughter Rachel. Our family home. Which has been running a construction business for generations, it's just a five-minute walk from our house. When I grow up, I'll be an architect. I'll design and you build it, Dad. Sure, if Emily designs it, I'll build the best house. Working with my daughter would make me the happiest man. My dream has always been to be an architect since elementary school. As I grew up, the desire to work at my family's business faded, and I went to an architecture school far from my hometown. After graduation, I joined a housing manufacturer, gained practical experience, and obtained my first-class architect license. About three years into my career, I recognized a familiar face among the salespeople who visited the company. Excuse me. Aren't you, Mr. Brian? I used to work at the restaurant in N Hotel. Huh? Oh, Emily, did you really become an architect? Brian, my husband, worked at the same part-time job for two years during college, though we attended different universities. Being a rare female aspiring architect, I was quite remembered, and it seems he remembered me too. We immediately hit it off with old stories and exchanged contact information, deciding to go out for a meal later. His company, a general trading company dealing with construction materials, had become our sales representative six months ago. Although we never really talked while working part time, I found out that he was more fun than I expected. After several dinners together, he asked me out. And two years later, he proposed. We went to see my family to introduce Brian. My parents and brother welcomed him joyfully, and Brian seemed relieved. We had no plans for a wedding ceremony, but my father pleaded, "Even a small one, but please have it in our hometown." Reluctantly, we agreed. My father shed tears of joy. And that night turned into a celebration with nearby relatives. Sorry, my dad was a bit pushy about it. No, it's fine. Your dad's great. I could really see how much your family loves you. My parents were toxic. I'm envious. On the way back by the car, Brian hesitantly talked about his family. During our relationship, he rarely spoke about his family. My family home is gone now. My mom passed away five years ago, and my dad went back to his hometown. My sister is already married and lives in another state. Huh? We are going to see your father, right? Yeah, I've reserved a place near where my dad lives. I'm planning to invite my sister there too. My father-in-law used to get drunk and violent at home from Brian's childhood. He would yell and sometimes hit his mother. Although he was diligent at work, he'd start drinking as soon as he got home. My mother-in-law never left him. 
and she eventually passed away due to her chronic illness. Mom always cares about what Dad thinks. We were always secondary. I don't have any memories of being loved by my parents. That's terrible. That's why I'll never be like my father. I will definitely make you happy. His words of determination warmed my heart. When we finally met my father-in-law, he was surprisingly small and quiet. However, he seemed restless and eager to leave early. Congratulations on your marriage. Sorry, but I don't have any money, and I don't want to be bothered. So don't bother inviting me to any wedding. My father-in-law's indifferent words made it seem like he had no interest in his son's marriage. My sister-in-law looked down apologetically. I understand. We're not planning to have a wedding ceremony, so don't worry. Although we intended to talk about the wedding ceremony, Brian didn't seem to want to bring it up anymore. He smiled, but his voice sounded very sad. I gently gripped his hand under the table. His hand gripping my back was cold and trembled slightly. At that moment, I vowed to myself to make Brian happy and to be his greatest supporter. After getting married, I discovered Brian had a peculiar habit. Brian is not good with change and tends to run away from reality by leaving home when he is mentally distressed. There have been two significant incidents that stood out to me. The first incident happened about half a year after we got married. At that time. Brian had been transferred to a different department and was struggling with the unfamiliar work. One day, he came home later than usual, unusually cheerful and drunk. Emily, sorry, I quit my job. What? Are you drunk? Surprised, I asked him, and he just laughed it off, waving his hands dismissively. Yeah, I quit. I can't do that kind of work anymore. I can't. Saying this cheerfully, he then collapsed onto the sofa and immediately fell asleep, snoring. I was anxious, unable to tell if he was joking or serious. However, the next day, hangover, he confirmed that he had indeed quit his job. Two days later, without any warning, he just left the house. I tried contacting him numerous times, but there was no response. When I finally decided to consult my sister-in-law, she casually said, "It happens often. Just leave him alone." Eventually, he returned home as if nothing had happened. Sorry, with marriage and the department change, it was mentally tough. I needed some time alone to calm down, but I'm okay now. I was so worried. Please rely on me more when you're struggling. We are husband and wife, right? Yeah, I understand. Sorry. Looking back, there was also a time just before our wedding when I couldn't reach Brian. Maybe he was escaping reality due to the stress back then too. When anxious, he seemed to need time alone to sort out his feelings. Later. He was diagnosed with depression at the hospital after being considerably affected at work. Financially, we were stable since I was working, but the uncertainty of Brian's sudden departure always left me anxious. My mother had been my confidant, and one day my father made a suggestion. "Hello, I heard from your mom. How about you and Brian come back here for a while?" A change of environment might be good. We are here to support and watch over you both. The kindness in my father's words, after all the worry I had been through alone, warmed my heart. When I told Brian, he responded positively. It might be better than staying here. Thinking of Brian, I decided to quit the company I had worked at for six years and return to my hometown. 
When we moved back, my dad had already found us a rental house near our family home. I took some time off work on Guan walks and drives to local tourist spots with Brian. Being in a nature rich area, he seemed to gradually regain his spirits. One day, while having dinner at my parents' house, my father said, Brian, you used to work in building material cells, right? I know someone who's looking for a salesperson. Would you be interested in trying out? Really? If I can, I would love to. Thank you. My husband's eyes sparkled with the prospect of returning to work. My dad, delighted, immediately called Mr. Jackson of the building materials store. He's got time tomorrow. Let's go together and talk to him. Wait, Dad, why are you coming too? My dad was probably worried. But Brian seemed more at ease with him accompanying us. The next day, he returned from the interview in high spirits. I'm home. I start working there next week. It seems like a really family friendly and comfortable place. Mr. Jackson is a nice guy, right? Take it easy and learn the job at your own pace. <laughs> Both the boss and your dad said the same thing. Everyone is so nice here. I'm really glad we moved. Seeing Brian regain his happiness made me incredibly joyful. He became brighter and more cheerful as he started working. Everyone knew about his depression diagnosis, so they were kind and considerate, but most importantly, he enjoyed his work. You know, I think the countryside suits me better. Everyone's kind and things are going well with their clients. Maybe this is where my talents really flourish. What talent? The talent of being a capable salesman, of course. I was hurting to see him joking like that. When the time felt right, I also returned to work at my family's business. A year later, I found out I was pregnant, and Brian and my parents were overjoyed. Everything seemed to be going well. Then, a second shocking incident happened. Brian left for work and never came back. His phone seemed to be off, unreachable. Again, that was my honest feeling. How many times will this happen? I was angry that he left without a word, and I felt a sense of worthlessness. And now, with a baby in my belly, in a panic, I called Mr. Jackson, and his response surprised me. Huh? He's been off work for the last four days. I thought you guys were going somewhere. Huh? Oh, I see. Sorry. Unexpectedly, this time he had properly informed his workplace. It might be different this time. Trusting Brian, I waited. And he returned after the holiday with a charm for a safe childbirth. Sorry, I was happy about the pregnancy, but when I thought about our family growing, I suddenly got scared. But I'm okay now. I've made up my mind. Seriously, you should at least call or message me. What would you have done if I had a miscarriage from worrying too much? I cried in relief, and Brian apologized repeatedly. My pregnancy must have felt like a huge responsibility to him. He shared his fears about becoming a parent, not knowing what parental love feels like. Though I may not fully understand his anxieties, I strongly felt that we should overcome them together. After our daughter Rachel was born, Brian seemed completely settled and stopped leaving home unexpectedly. He made friends through work and started going out more after work and on weekends. I'm going fishing with Eric from work tomorrow. I'll be leaving in the middle of the night, so can you just prepare some sandwiches for me? Huh? Weren't we supposed to go to the zoo with Rachel tomorrow? What are you going to do about that promise? Oh, 
I forgot about that. Sorry, but I can't cancel now. Can you go with your mom and dad instead? As Rachel grew older, Brian increasingly prioritized hanging out with his friends. You know, you are Rachel's father. Sorry, sorry. I have a lot of friends. You know, I have a lot of commitments. Everyone likes me. Maybe living in the countryside really suits me. His overconfidence was evident in such mistaken beliefs. However, I felt he was deliberately avoiding spending time with Rachel, using his busy schedule as an excuse. Brian's behavior became noticeably strange about three months ago. He started going out more frequently after work and on weekends. He often broke promises with Rachel, leading to frequent arguments between us. You are really annoying. Rachel is too young to remember promises. Just accept that my socializing is part of my job. Children aren't stupid. You'll regret this someday. Yeah, yeah.、Mm-hmm. The kind and gentle husband I knew before was gone. Recently, he even started making excuses to avoid family gatherings at my parents' house. I couldn't imagine why this was happening. This continued until one Sunday morning, when I woke up. Brian was already gone. On the living room table, there was a note: "Please don't look for me. Thank you for everything." Panicked, I tried calling him repeatedly, but he never answered. I felt utterly despairing. This time, it wasn't just another incident. For the first time, he left without saying a word to me.、Uh, this was not something to be happy about. I felt like I saw Brian's determination in that note, and all I could do was cry out loud. On Monday, I went with my father to visit Mr. Jackson's company. It seemed Brian hadn't shown up for work. I haven't heard anything about him. Taking leave or quitting, he was working normally on Friday, but, but what? Mr. Jackson hesitated, looking uncomfortable. Please stay calm. A new female employee who was absent without notice along with Brian has also been missing since yesterday. His unexpected words made me gasp. Did Brian say anything to you the day before he disappeared? Huh? I panicked for a moment. The day before, what was it? Did he say anything important? He seemed cheerful while having his evening drink and was talking about something. Ah, he was saying something about how cute the new girl at work was compared to me. My father sighed deeply. You're usually so level-headed, but you become completely clueless about your own matters. If Brian calls again, it will be good to record it. Hearing this, Mr. Jackson slapped his knee. Oh, I have the perfect thing for that—a high-quality voice recorder we use for important meetings. I was somewhat pushed into taking the voice recorder. I didn't think Brian would call, but if he did, indeed, I might get flustered and not remember what was said. There might be some hint hidden in his words. Indeed, after coming down at home, I remembered what Brian had said the day before he disappeared. The new girl at work is just twenty, really pure and cute. I think I'm the type who can succeed in the countryside. I want to start life all over again with someone like her. So, Brian had clearly talked about his plans for the future the day before, smirking at my reaction. Since then, I practiced recording calls with the voice recorder, preparing for whenever he might call next. This time, I wouldn't miss his true intentions. Ten days later, a call from Brian came. My heart raced. Calm down, calm down. 
I switched the call to speaker mode and started recording just as I had practiced. Hello, it's me. Have you received divorce papers yet? Hearing Brian's voice for the first time in ten days sounded like he was taunting me for being so exhausted. Where are you? Leaving just a letter like that? I was worried. Sorry, sorry. I'm not coming back anymore. I need you to file the divorce papers that I sent you. I'm planning to remarry soon, so please do it quickly. Recently, an envelope containing the completed divorce papers arrived. It seemed this man had no guilt towards the life we had shared or towards our daughter. To me, it felt like my daughter and I were just discarded toys to him. I bit my lip and spoke more firmly. Where are you? What are you planning to do about Rachel? Even if we are getting divorced, we need to meet and talk. Dad and Mr. Jackson are worried about you. The moment I said that, Brian burst into laughter. I'm tired of being considerate towards your father and the boss. If I stay there. I'm going to have to be petty for the rest of my life, right? I'm sick and tired of it. I'm not your slave, you know. I was shocked. I never knew Brian had such thoughts. I have tried to be considerate about living in a place where he doesn't know anyone, but have I made him feel trapped? I'm not coming back. I'm not afraid of getting fired. A client has recognized my abilities and offered me a job. I can finally live a free life. As I became increasingly desperate, Brian's voice was incredibly cheerful. Then a woman's voice came on the phone. "Madame, please forgive us. Our love is real. Please don't look for us. I'm pregnant." "What?" Shocked by this revelation. Brian then delivered the final blow. That's how it is. So I'm sorry, but I don't need Rachel. You can raise her on your own, right? Take care. Even after the call ended, I couldn't move for a while. He doesn't need Rachel. My hands were trembling. Even if God forgives Brian, I will never forgive him. I called my father. Gripped the voice recorder tightly and ran towards Mr. Jackson's company. Since Brian left, I had been reflecting on our seven years of marriage. There was something both of us had never realized. I'm the complete opposite of my dad. Brian always said that, and I believed it too. But perhaps they were similar in their mental weakness. What Brian is doing now is no different from what his father did when he drank and became violent. He is trying to alleviate his accumulated anxieties and frustrations by abandoning us. With these thoughts, I arrived at Miss Jackson's company, where my father and the parents of the missing Sarah were waiting in the president's office. Emily, these are Sarah's parents. We'd like you to let them hear the recording as well. I understand the feelings of parents worry about their missing daughter. The woman, who was rumored to be the other woman, was thought to be serious and naive. Given her age of twenty, it might have been Sarah's first romance. I'm sorry for my daughter's behavior. She was always just a serious girl. Sarah's parents. With pale faces, bowed their heads in apology, and I bowed in return. I'm sorry too for my husband's actions. This might be shocking for you, but with that introduction, I played the record phone call for everyone to hear. When Sarah's voice came on, her father slapped his thigh in frustration. That naive fool! I'll drag her back home if I have to. Sarah's father was furious, turning red with anger, while her mother collapsed in tears upon learning of the pregnancy. He mentioned a client, 
I'll check with the contacts he was handling. Mr. Jacob called Brian's clients, but none of them knew anything about the story he had mentioned. Hmm. The person in church might be cooperating with him, so I'll inquire higher up. Probably one of these big branches, right? My father had always been a people person, easily making friends with anyone, regardless of seniority, since his student days. Especially among business owners, his network was surprisingly extensive. Don't underestimate the power of rural networks. In about an hour, we discovered the client Brian was referring to, which branch he was supposed to be employed at, and where he was living were quickly identified. Needless to say, by the end of the day, the employment offered to Brian was withdrawn. That night, a panicked call came from him. What did you do? I just got a call saying the employment offer is off. Huh? I didn't do anything. But maybe finding a job around there might be difficult now. Why? The place where the two eloped was over two hours away by car, yet still in the same state. You said it yourself, didn't you? The countryside has close knit and warm connections. But what happens when you turn those connections into enemies? You understand, right? Anyway, come back once with Sarah. Then we'll talk. The next day, as promised, Brian returned to Mr. Jackson's office with Sarah. He looked down with an odd expression on his face, a far cry from the phone call the other day. Brian. I'm really disappointed in you. You've been awful, and you're fired, just like you wanted. I know you said you weren't afraid, but don't think you can work in the same type of business around here. It was almost frightening to watch the normally mild-mannered Mr. Jackson speak so nonchalantly with the face of a business manager beside me. Brian's lips trembled, and he seemed unable to say anything. It wasn't just your ability to get things gone well over here. My dad and the others put in the groundwork to protect you. Don't get wrong. As I said this, I was so frustrated that it had come to this that tears began to well up in my eyes. Then, a little later, Sarah's parents came running in. Dad, you idiot! Sarah rushes back to hide behind Brian's back. He also spreads his hands out protectively and begins to plead with Sarah's parents. She is pregnant. Please don't be rough with her. I am also inadvertently hurt by the way he acts like a man. I don't know if I can give my daughter to a man who would so easily abandon his own child. Sarah, do you understand? He is the kind of man who would abandon a young child. You will be abandoned sooner or later. I will never allow you to marry such a man. No, Dad. We love each other. Brian left his family for me. I'll marry him for sure. Mr. Jackson's and my father stopped Sarah's father from trying to hit Sarah. The father's face was flushed so red that his veins stood out, and his anger was tremendous. You fell in love with a devilish man who abandoned his family without a second thought, eloped with him, and now you're pregnant. You've got to be kidding me. The way the father speaks to her, as if he is shouting, is heartbreaking. As the same parent, beside him, Sarah's mother is shedding tears. I have so many things I want to say to Brian. Brian, you always said you hate your father, right? That he hurt your mom and never showed you love as a child. Aren't you just like him now? Brian frowned. Not seeming to understand what I was saying, and retorted, "What? I'm nothing like my dad. I don't drink and get violent. 
don't compare me to that low life. I care about Sarah and I love our baby. But you said you don't need Rachel. You hurt your wife and don't give love to your child, Rachel, right? Brian froze with a huff. Then he instantly understood what I was trying to say and started shaking as if hurt. It's me who's hurt hearing him talk about loving his affair partner and their unborn baby. Me, like my father? Yes, you and your father are essentially the same. Weak and cowardly scumbags. Brian looked down and seemed to be stunned and thinking about something for a while. Then he started mumbling to himself. I thought I could live as myself here. I felt accepted, praised, and welcomed. I thought I was a capable person when the client offered me a job. Sarah admired me too. Was it all a mistake? His gaze remained on the floor, and he seemed to be organizing his thoughts by putting them into words. A client asked me if I wanted to come to his branch. I thought, I'm a person who can do it. I have been thinking I'm a very capable person. Sarah also complimented me on how great I was, so I got excited. Was it a misunderstanding? At this point, Brian closed his mouth and wiped the sweat from his forehead. He looked as if he had just woken up from a dream. Everyone, Emily's precious family, they accepted me too. He then sat down, clutching his head in realization. Too late to realize now, I screamed internally. Sarah, sorry, maybe I was wrong. Let's call off the elopement. I can't do this. Sarah, shocked by his sudden change of heart, exclaimed, What are you saying now? You said we were meant to be, that you love me. I'm ready to leave everything for you. Let's live somewhere far away, just two of us. But as Brian hesitated, I answered for him. This man has a weak mental state, can't handle change, and has a habit of escaping reality. If you go to an unfamiliar place, he might just leave you and the baby behind. It's typical behavior for him. Sarah looked at Brian in shock. Then Sarah's mother, who had been silent until now, chiefly pleaded. You deserve to be happy. Happiness can't be built on someone else's unhappiness. Imagine this man leaving you and your baby behind. Brian wouldn't do that. Face reality. Look at his wife right now. Their daughter has been abandoned. And you are complicit in this suffering. But, confronted with her mother's intense words, Sarah finally looked at me. Seeing my exhausted state, she collapsed to her knees, crying. Despite my resentment, watching her parents, I couldn't help but see my grown-up daughter, 20-year-old Sarah. Unbelievably, Brian then turned to me for support. I finally realized it. You were the one who understood and supported me, despite my weakness. I'll break up with her. Please give me another chance. Mr. Jackson, let me work here again. Before I could respond, Sarah stood up and slapped him hard. The sound echoed, and Brian staggered. You finally woke me up. I can't believe I was with such a worthless man. We are breaking up. Expect a claim for alimony and child support. Sarah, though still crying, had a newfound determination in her eyes. She approached and apologized to me. I've done something unforgivable. I'm truly sorry. I will definitely pay the compensation. With that, Sarah left the room, supported by her parents, without looking back at Brian. I really messed up. 
I shouldn't have gone along with her. From now on, I'll only care about Emily and Rachel. I won't do anything this stupid again. I felt an urge to trample on my desperately pleading Brian's lowered head. You are the worst. You didn't care about how that girl felt, did you? I'm divorcing you. I'll be asking for alimony and child support, so make sure you pay it. Emily, please, Rachel still needs a father, right? Huh? Didn't you always say it would have been better if your father wasn't there? I feel the same. Rachel is better off without a father like you. I yelled out loud, probably saying the last thing Brian wanted to hear. My father then patted his shoulder. The discussion is over. Go back to your hometown. You won't get a decent job around here. I won't forgive someone who hurt my daughter and granddaughter. But but that's. Seeing my father's genuinely angry face, Ryan realized it was too late for him. If you really want to prove you're different from your father, pay child support properly. I'm really sorry, Emily. I was a fool. Sorry, Rachel. I am sorry. Finally, I felt like I heard sincere regret and apology from Brian. Mr. Jackson and my father helped him stand up and escorted him to the car. He looked at me with sad eyes, silently, as they drove him to the station. The divorce was finalized without much delay. Brian lived in a rented apartment for a while, but eventually moved to the area where his sister lives. And seems to be working diligently now. With the alimony for Sarah, he'll likely be busy working for some time. We are flying distance from my hometown, so we might never meet again. Every month, I receive a letter from Brian with an apology, a report of the child support payment, and a card for Rachel. He has promised to pay child support until the end. I hope he faces his weakness without running away. Sarah later came to apologize with her parents, bringing the alimony. Unfortunately, it seems that Sarah later suffered a miscarriage due to stress. I now understand how painful it is for a mother when her child suffers. She said while crying and apologizing, "I decided to forgive her." Sarah is still young. I hope she learns to judge people better and finds happiness in the future. I've returned to my family home, and with my mother's help, I'm balancing work and raising Rachel. We are planning to build a small house nearby, as my brother will eventually live in our family home. My goal is to complete it before Rachel enters middle school. Oh, you're building the house. I'll use my network to make it the best house I can. My father is terrifying to make enemies with, which just shows how deep his love is. I plan to live happily with Rachel, treasuring the relationships with the people around us, without betraying that love. Don't worry, she won't wake up for a while. We have two bedrooms in the suite, so there's no way she'll find out. Really? Then we have to enjoy ourselves to the fullest. After enjoying the dinner at the hotel on the eve of my wedding, I woke up engulfed in intense sleepiness, only to find my husband, James, in the midst of an affair with a woman named Alyssa. Clutching my aching head, I desperately tried to gather evidence. I was infuriated to discover that James had been cheating on me while pretending to work overtime. I couldn't forgive him. He thought he could get away with it and quietly let the wedding and honeymoon pass. I decided to create and execute a plan that would put James and his mistress in the most embarrassing situation possible. I, Kathy Stewart, a 38-year-old municipal office worker and the protagonist. Living a routine life of work and home, I found it hard to encounter new people. 
Until now, I lamented the lack of opportunities and interests. However, a friend introduced me to a man named James Stewart. Kathy. I like you. Please go out with me. Me? Oh, definitely. I'd be delighted. Although I didn't find him particularly handsome or my type. His sincerity attracted me, and we started dating. I thought I would never meet someone who loved me so much for who I am. As our relationship was aimed at marriage, James had already arranged everything for the wedding and honeymoon. But the troubles that arose with the bookings are unforgettable. James was a bit careless with money and often failed to prepare payments on time for the wedding venue and travel agency. He always made excuses and did nothing unless I prompted him. You need to deposit money in the account for the payments to go through. I've told you several times to do it before the deadline, haven't I? I couldn't help it. I didn't have time to go to the bank because of work. Then you should have discussed it in advance. Or transferred the money online. Why didn't you consult with me? I'm swamped with work before the wedding and honeymoon. I'm not as free as you are. Despite occasional disputes, we somehow managed the preparations. As the wedding approached, the final arrangements, including guest lists, gifts, and menu confirmations, became intense. Sometimes, I had to go to the venue for meetings, which often didn't go smoothly because James would cancel at the last minute. Citing work reasons. I ended up making decisions alone, which felt a bit lonely. You've been working late a lot recently, especially on days we had plans. And you come home late. I have a lot to wrap up at work since we'll be away for the wedding and honeymoon. It can't be helped. If you tell me in advance about the unavoidable work and overtime. We could reschedule our meetings. Is that too difficult? It's not always possible to know in advance, and some things just can't be helped. Lately, he's been returning home late at night without contact. Citing overtime, but his salary hasn't increased much. Suspicious, I looked at his pay slip and noticed something odd. His overtime hours were in single digits. Looking at this pay slip, you only had 7 hours of overtime last month? Yeah, so? But last month, you cancelled our wedding meeting 4 times due to overtime. And you came home after I slept almost every day. Isn't 7 hours of overtime strange? Are you doubting me? It's not about doubt. But it's strange to have such little overtime despite working late every day. That's impossible. You never worked as a company employee. So you don't understand. Maybe, but single-digit overtime hours still seem odd. So what, you want to complain to my boss on my behalf? Ridiculous thoughts, it's irritating. He angrily left the room, slamming the door. I'm sick of this. I don't even want to see your face anymore. I wanted to discuss our honeymoon plans and sightseeing. As I stared at the door James left through, I heard a notification sound. My phone is always on silent mode, so it must be James's work phone. On the table, James's work phone, without a cover, displayed a visible screen. Did James leave his work phone here? Wait, what's this message? I froze as I saw the message notification displayed on the unadorned. Simplistic lock screen of a work phone that didn't even have a protective cover. It was a message that didn't seem work-related at all. The message, registered under the name Alyssa, read, I want to go on a trip. The casual, informal tone of the message gave me a bad feeling. It was a work phone, so it could be a colleague or someone related to work. But the content suggested otherwise. The nature of the message was suspicious, but I couldn't access the contents due to the lock. I decided to forget about the message for now and focus on the wedding and honeymoon preparations. Despite the chaos, I remember feeling relieved. When all the wedding preparations were finally complete. The wedding is finally the day after tomorrow. 
I'm also excited about staying at the hotel the night before. Yeah, let's make it a great ceremony, just like us. Our wedding ceremony was to be held at a hotel and as a special plan benefit. We were allowed to stay in an exclusive suite the night before. Both James and I took the day off to prepare, so we headed to the hotel in the afternoon. We took a leisurely bath and then went to the top floor restaurant for dinner. It's wonderful that we get to stay in a suite as a special benefit. For having our wedding at the hotel. Yeah! Sorry for leaving most of the preparation to you, Kathy. It's okay. You seemed busy with work. And the planner did a great job, so it all worked out, right? It had been a while since James and I had the chance to have a leisurely conversation. I realized we hadn't had much time together due to our busy schedules. Kathy, I remember you being quite demanding, but that planner was amazing. She managed to incorporate your requests while preparing everything so well. Demanding? Well, I do appreciate her help. It would have been tough without her. We arrived at the restaurant and took our seats. As we enjoyed the exquisite dishes, I noticed James's glass was empty. What would you like to drink next? Hmm. Not sure. Oh. Kathy, is that a stain on your sleeve? Maybe sauce? James pointed at the sleeve of my dress. What? Oh no. Maybe it's from the dressing earlier. I hope it doesn't stain. If it's oil, it might stay. Better go clean it off quickly, especially since you're taking that dress on the honeymoon. Alright, I'll be right back. Fortunately, I had brought a stain remover just in case. I hurried to the restroom to check my sleeve. Huh? There's no stain. Maybe James mistook a shadow for a stain? I hurried back to the table, expecting the main dish to be served soon. Ah. Uh. Welcome back. I ordered drinks for us. Yours too. Thank you. Wait, is this a cocktail? Yes. I found a cocktail that I thought you'd like. What do you think? It's nice of you, but remember. We decided not to drink alcohol today because of the wedding tomorrow. Did we? But one drink should be fine, right? Please try it, it's special. Reluctantly, I took a sip. The cocktail had a beautiful gradient of orange and yellow. A refreshing taste with orange flavor, not too sweet, and a hint of herbs. Delicious. Not too sweet, with a refreshing herbal taste. You really know my preferences, James. I knew you'd say that. You think I don't know what you like? My apologies. What are you drinking? This? It's also a cocktail, but I think it's a flavor you wouldn't like. Really? Usually, James would offer me to taste his drink, but this time, he subtly refused. After a leisurely meal, we returned to our room. And I was suddenly overcome with extreme sleepiness. I had wanted to enjoy the sweet more, but I couldn't resist the urge to sleep and collapsed on the bed. Sorry, I'm really sleepy. I'll just take a shower and go to bed early. Understood. You've been busy with the wedding preparations lately. Rest well for tomorrow's big day. It was quite early, before 8 p.m., when I went to bed. When I suddenly woke up and tried to get up, I heard voices. At first, I thought James was on the phone, but then I felt a slight headache. I went to grab some headache medicine from my pouch and felt something was off. Could there be someone else in the room? But who? This suite was provided by the hotel for just the two of us. It seemed odd that someone else would be present. Really? Is it okay? Your wife is sleeping, right? It's fine, she won't wake up for a while. We have two bedrooms in the suite, so she won't notice. Is that so? Then we must enjoy ourselves to the fullest. I heard a woman's voice clearly, realizing this wasn't a phone call. 
Another woman was in the suite with James. I remembered the hotel staff mentioning that the suite had two bedrooms. Clutching my aching head, I quietly took my phone and headed towards the other bedroom. I captured their affair on my newly purchased smartphone for our honeymoon. The latest model captured their actions clearly in the dark. It was 9.30 p.m. Thinking it was still early enough to act. I recorded a video and quickly contacted someone after returning to my bed. I contacted my parents, my in-laws, and James' boss. Grateful that I had their numbers from a previous gathering. I sent the video of their affair to them with a message. My parents and in-laws replied immediately, saying they would come to the room to talk. However, I anticipated the worst-case scenario. A sudden confrontation might lead James to deny everything. A well-planned approach might cause more damage in the long run. I asked my parents and in-laws, who were also staying at the hotel, to wait for me in the elevator hall on the suite floor. As I looked around the bedroom, I noticed that James's and his mistress's clothes were carelessly discarded near the bed. I carefully gathered them and locked them away in a nearby safe. I locked the safe haphazardly, making sure they couldn't retrieve their clothes. The suite's large size worked in my favor, as neither of them noticed me awake. All I could hear from the bedroom where they were enjoying themselves were James's and his mistress's voices. They were oblivious to the fact that I was awake, that their affair had been discovered, and that both sets of parents were on their way to the room. After moving my belongings, I hid in a closet near the door and started fiddling with my phone. Hiding in the closet, I played the sound of a fire alarm at high volume from my phone. Hey, is that a siren from outside? What's that noise? Hey. That's the sound of a fire alarm. Is the hotel on fire? No. I don't want to die yet. It's okay. I won't let you die. They panicked and rushed out of the room. After confirming they had run a few meters down the hallway. I closed the door and overheard their conversation from outside. Wait, isn't it a fire? But we just heard the sound of a fire alarm, right? It seemed they had finally realized what was happening. Hey, James, what's with that outfit? And who's that girl next to you? That's not Kathy, is it? Who is she? What? The fire? What are you talking about, being half asleep? Do you realize how you look? Realizing their situation, the two of them began to panic. Noticing their undignified state of just holding towels, surrounded by both sets of parents. What's this? James, what's going on? I don't know. Did you deceive me? Having my parents and in-laws waiting by the elevator was the right move. And why are my dad and mom here? And Kathy's parents too? Didn't you know? As family, we were staying at the hotel on the eve of the wedding. What? I didn't know the family was staying at the hotel. Anyway, sort yourself out first. We'll talk after that. Ha! <laughs> yes, you're right. Sorry, I'll just go back to the room for my clothes. He tried to enter the room, but couldn't due to the auto lock. James frustratingly rattled the door handle, but there was no way he could open it from the outside. My phone. I can open it from inside. Wait, sorry, just a moment, please. Wait, James. Our phones are inside, right? What are we going to do? Ah, uh. that's bad. Hey. Kathy. You're in there, right? Are you awake? Open the door, please. Hearing that James had drugged me to sleep made me even angrier. How could he say, are you awake? Open the door, after making me sleep? I checked through the peephole to see James in a flustered state. Almost naked, before opening the door. You didn't know your parents and mine were staying at this hotel? Of course, you wouldn't. 
You left all the wedding and honeymoon preparations to me. Hey. You knew and didn't tell me? I did tell you that our parents would be staying on a different floor. Maybe you didn't listen because you were always so dismissive. I thought so. Then the mistress started making a fuss. But now. Let us in the room. Do you realize the situation? Excuse me, but who might you be? You were having fun in the bedroom with James, right? Panicked and ran out when you heard the fire alarm and now caught cheating, right? I'm Alyssa, dating James. Lady, you know what's going on, so let us in the room, please. Well, please come in. Now, dad, mom, and also father-in-law and mother-in-law, please come in. I invited both sets of parents into the room. Hey. My parents have nothing to do with this. That's not true, is it? We need an explanation. Kathy, sorry, but we're coming in. Yes, please come in. I also want to resolve this matter here and now. As they entered, James and Alyssa rushed to the bed to look for their clothes. Where are the clothes? No, my clothes are gone too. James, do you know? How would I know? Damn. So we're supposed to stay naked? Right. There were bathrobes in this room. At least we can wear those. They hurried to the bathroom, but it was too late. I had already taken the bathrobes and large towels while they were busy. No way, the bathrobes are gone? Hey. There are no bath towels either. No clothes, no towels, what's going on? I stood in front of them holding the bathrobes. Looking for these bathrobes? Hey. Hand them over. I'm starting to get cold. I'm cold, lady, give them to us, please. Ignoring their clamor, I walked into the bathroom with the two robes. The bathroom was left as they enjoyed it, with the bathtub full of water. But I submerged the robes in it. Hey. What are you doing? What are you doing to us, lady? Telling us to stay naked. People like you don't deserve anything in this room. Why don't you stay naked quietly? The two of them seemed to resign themselves and fell silent. Now, Kathy and James, and you. Alyssa, was it? Let's hear what you have to say. Surrounded by my parents and his in-laws, James looked smaller than I had ever seen. It was just a fling before the wedding, a bit of fun. That's a lie. James, you said we'd go on a honeymoon together. You were going to divorce after the wedding and then be with me. That was just a slip of the tongue. You should know the difference between a joke and seriousness. A joke, huh? Kathy told me that you hadn't been involved in the wedding or honeymoon preparations. And you've been coming home late every night. No. Um, work has been busy. James then whispered to me in a low voice. Hey, you've been ratting on me to your family? Don't you trust your husband? Telling on me, that's a dirty move. Who's playing dirty? Working overtime for just seven hours. Seven hours of overtime? Kathy, what do you mean? My mother-in-law asked, looking puzzled. About two or three months before the wedding. James's return home suddenly became late. He said it was overtime. But his payslip showed single-digit overtime hours, around seven hours every month. Coming home late at night with just seven hours of overtime? That's strange. Still talking about that. Not all overtime hours get approved, you know? That's common knowledge for a salaryman. James was waving his hands frantically, his face red. Maybe it's time to be honest? I later asked James's company. And they said he's been leaving work on time every day for the wedding preparations. Could it be that he finished work on time and then? Yes, that's exactly what happened. He didn't come home after work, left all the wedding and honeymoon preparations to me. 
and spend his time enjoying himself with his mistress. Glancing at them, I noticed the in-laws had expressions like angry demons. James. Have you even thought about Kathy? Betraying someone who loved you, and you feel nothing about it? This betrayal is unforgivable. No, you shouldn't apologize, mother. Then, my father slowly asked a question. James, if you were going to cheat, shouldn't you have just not married in the first place? Did you cheat because you prefer Alyssa here? No, it was just a moment of weakness. Lies. James said to me, my wife works at the city office and won't get fired. She'll always have an income. I wouldn't choose an old maid like her otherwise. You told me that. Hearing James's true thoughts from Alyssa's mouth, I couldn't help but sigh. James, now that it's like this, marry me. I can cook and I'll be a good wife. That's ridiculous. Alyssa, weren't you saying you're going to become an influencer? And not renewing your contract at my company? An influencer housewife, that sounds great. I don't care about being an influencer or whatever. I can't marry a woman who's just trying to leech off me. Listening to this ridiculous exchange between the two naked fools was giving me a headache. For the record, I'm not working just to support James. And I can't continue this marriage after such an incident. We're getting a divorce. Can't you reconsider? The wedding is tomorrow, and my boss is here. We can't just cancel it now, can we? He was still only thinking about himself even in this situation. Reconsider? No way. Do you even realize what you've done? I'm sorry, let's make up and start over, okay? Seeing James's behavior, my father intervened. Start over? Are you treating your marriage to my daughter like a game? Exactly. You think you can just apologize and reset everything when you're in trouble? It doesn't work like that. Eventually, the wedding scheduled for the next day was cancelled. And naturally, James was responsible for the cancellation fees. Alyssa had been aggressively pursuing James. Apparently wanting to get married before turning 26, but James was planning to break up with her. The cancellation of the wedding and James' usual behavior. At the company had already sparked rumors about his affair with Alyssa, a temporary employee. James was called into the office to discuss the recent commotion and his relationship with Alyssa. Despite his attempts to deny it, testimonies and eyewitness accounts exposed everything. As a result, James was transferred to a regional branch, but he couldn't stand it and resigned. However, his job search wasn't going well, his reputation preceded him. And he was being rejected in interviews. Alyssa didn't renew her contract and boldly started her activities as an influencer. Unfortunately, the internet is a tough place, and she was quickly labeled as a mistress. Recently, she's been posting online, desperately trying to gain attention and earn money. Even if it means igniting controversies, becoming a notorious figure of the times. One day, while I was handling customer service at the office, Alyssa came to the counter and started yelling. I came here because I heard James said you work here. It's your fault I can't work as an influencer. What can I help you with today? If there's no specific matter, I must ask you to leave. You're the one, aren't you? Writing about affairs and adultery online. You're living off our taxes and writing such things on that computer. I'm not aware of such things. Please, don't cause trouble for others. I signaled and called the security guard. Luckily, working in a department with frequent complaints, security quickly came to my aid. Let me go. I have business with this lady. This is a municipal office. If you continue to disturb others, we may have to call the police. I dealt with the situation calmly and as usual. I never thought my training in handling complaints would come in handy in such a situation. After that, Alyssa stopped visiting me, which was a relief. I continued working at the city office. 
It's busy with work every day. But being busy helps me forget about the divorce and the whole debacle. One day, an old friend from university contacted me, wanting to introduce me to someone. Apparently, we both like the same cartoon artist, so we might get along well. It's rare to find someone who knows that cartoon, so I was surprised. This friend knows my tastes and interests. So if they recommend meeting someone, I definitely want to try. After what happened with James, I wondered what would become of my life. But now, with work and new encounters, every day is fulfilling.